Recording has started. Welcome back. In today's exercise, today's uh, discussion, we'll look at the review exercises from Chapter 21, Estimating the Accuracy of Percentages. A survey organization draws a simple random sample of a thousand registered voters in a certain town. In the sample, 32,000 approve of the mayor. The organization estimates that, actually 32,000, 32% approve of the mayor. The organization estimates that 32% of all 50,000 registered voters in the town approve of the mayor. Great, how to figure the standard error? The organization realizes that the number in the sample who approve blank 1000 draws blank box blank. Okay. And this is, I got a funny fill in the blank here. Fill in each blank with 33 words or less. Then work out the standard error. Uh, this seems tricky, but it's just a uh, funny wording. What they're trying to say here is that there's several words that go in some of these blanks and the total number of words is less than 33 but you shouldn't expect it to be just one word here but multiple words so first the organization realizes that the number in the sample who approve let's label these We'll prove, well, what are we approving of? Of the mayor? But there's more. And the sample who approved of the mayor is like, of course, 1,000 draws, or it's like actually the sum. of our 1,000 draws. And here in B, we want to remember to specify that the draws were made at random without replacement from a, now we're down to our box, from our box. And what's in this box? Fifty thousand voters, and the tickets are one ticket per person. It's just a, a, presumably a zero one, or I guess the votes would be approving of the mayor or disapproving. So this is from a box with a ticket for each voter. Yes, technically registered voters, 
I know. I thought about that. I was just trying to write less. <laughs> You're very right, Molly. I like your precision. Keep it up. So we can also Uh, work out the standard error here. Let's see if we're going to do that again in a minute. So we just need a little more space, obviously, to work out our SE. Let's make some space here. Okay. So if we want to get our standard error, remember that going to go through a pathway of other terms. What other terms do you think we're going to need? Yep, the expected the expected value of the voters. Ugh. And what else? Yep, the standard error for the percentage. Good, and the standard deviation. Uh, <clears throat> anything else? Um. I think that our ex, the expected value for voters, we could, uh, I mean, I guess we'll, we will use the observed value. That's true. We'll use the observed value in getting the other ones. Uh, there we go. Okay, we'll go our observed value of the voters in the box in our sample. So, great. <clears throat> the mean of the box is going to be the correspond to the expected value of the voters. It'll be a proportion. So yes, we do need the mean of the box. It's, I was mentally embedding it in that one, but yes. The, it's technically not the mean of the box, it's the um, estimated mean, but 
Yep. <laughs> we'll get lots of terms along the way here. So let's go ahead and start with the simple uh, with a, our first step here, because we need to take our sample and get an inference of the about the population. We do. We already know that the organization estimates that 32 percent of all the 50,000 voters in the town approve. So that's our expected value. They oops, they bootstrapped and got 32%. How did they get 32%? Because it's the percentage in the sample. But we need to get the SE because we know that this is just an estimate. Then we need an interval. We would estimate the mean of the box to be 0.32. And let's go ahead and get our standard deviation because that's the next value we are going to need. Remember that this is a zero one box. So we can uh, use any, uh, we can use our shortcut. Uh, zero to one is gonna cancel out, or one minus zero, rather. And we're now multiplying by the square root of our big fraction the ones 0.32 times our smaller fraction which is then And here we have our 0 0.68 as the estimate of our standard deviation. <clears throat> oh, no, I thought that seemed a little weird. That's why I did it again. And it should be 0.46 or 47 with rounding. Yep. Remember, mathematics can't protect you from other kinds of errors, uh, which this was just a mathematic error, but. <clears throat> So we know our standard deviation, and now we can get our standard error. First, we need to get the standard error. For our sample, for the sum. And it's the number of draws, has the square root of the number of draws, times the standard deviation or the square root of how many draws? 1,000 times our standard deviation, 0 0.47. <laughs> and we think it's 14.5, I trust you. I'm going to trust your, I was just going to say, I don't know, 
given what you just said, if that's a good idea, it's probably not a prudent example of good uh, statistical judgment, but we'll trust you anyway, Stephen. And so now we have the standard error uh, for our sum, but we need to get the standard error for our percentage. So to make this a percentage, we can take our standard error of the sum and divide by our uh, number of draws. So it's 14. 0.5 divided by the number of draws, which was 1,000. And so what's the standard error of our percentage? <laughs> Approximately 1.45. Yes. Yep. Uh, we could say approximately 1.5 would be quite reasonable. Incidentally, uh, on the exams, when you fill in a blank, yeah, I would normally put the target answer as for this. I'd either put maybe, if I calc computed 1.45, I'd still give you a, a range to account for the rounding many people would enter 1.5 so there would be a range here i know that there's a range of scores so you would get credit there's no need to email me frantically to look at your exams i always always look at them every single one every person's individual responses oops um but and just as an aside So 1.45 is our standard error percent. Very good. Thanks. So now we have a Problem three here, and we'll take a look at the problem four too. Of the 500 sample households in the previous exercise, which we didn't do, that's fine. Seven had three or more large screen TVs. The percentage of households in the town with three or more large screen TVs is estimated as, uh, we would have to get an error here, uh, so <clears throat> we can go ahead and get this. We Let me give you a little more information. There's uh, the percentage of all households. There's uh, oops. Population is 25,000 households. We'll put them down here. And do you think we need any more information? Let's see what we have. We already know the end of our sample. It's 500.
So in our, we can easily find the percentage of households in the town with, we don't actually need the population numbers now, right now, um, because we can estimate the percentage of households in the town with three or more large screen TVs by just bootstrapping our data. I know it's fun to bootstrap. Uh, I think that's part of the popularity. It's just such a fun name for a statistical technique. If I invent a statistical technique, which I, I plan to someday, I'm definitely going to give it a fun name. Uh, in this case, the bootstrapping refers to the survey organizations pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, the bootstraps of their data. I don't know how it, I mean, it's a funny origin. Anyway, we can get our, uh, the expected value of the population percentage is going to be approximately the sample. give or take a standard error. So in our sample, seven out of 500 households had large screen TVs with a rate of 0.014 or 1.4%. <laughs> skip to the end point here so it's we would estimate that 1.4 percent of the households in the town would have <clears throat> large screen tvs or three or more excuse me and we need to get a standard error here to tell us how far off we expect this to be So this is like a box where we have ones are, are the three or more large screen TVs. And the zeros are fewer. Oops. Okay, <clears throat> and we know that the estimated fraction of ones in this box is about 1.4%. We need to get the SD of the box. I always forget to write that one in. But I was on the way to doing the SD of the box. And this is going to be another example of our SD shortcut, big minus small times the square root of our big fraction times the small fraction, 1 minus 0. We'll cancel out times our big fraction. Oops. Uh, remember that when we're finding the standard deviation, we need to use the proportional representation. This is a fraction, uh, so it's a proportional representation. So this one, the big fraction is 0 0.14 times our small fraction is going to be 1 minus that. 
or 0 0.9986 leading ultimately to a standard deviation when you work out the map here of 0 0.1 two approximately. We did do this the one zero, the ones are large screen TV and the zeros are less than or you know are the TV categories. And now that we have our standard deviation, we can go ahead and get our standard error. First for the sum, and then we'll get it for our percentage. The standard error is 2.68. And these are 2.68 households, because remember the standard error is in uh, the same quantity as the uh, expected value. And now our final step is to turn our standard error for our sample into a population representation. And we'll just take our SE for the sum and divide it by the n in the sample times 100. In this case, it's 2.68 over 500 times 100. And I bet somebody already figured it out. Why don't you tell us 54%? Thank you. So the estimate is likely to be off by 54% or so. <laughs> Um, 0.54. Yeah, that seems better. Sorry. Oh, I just can't see. Um, yeah, when you have a decimal, if you could put the a zero in front of it, it's really helpful because it's incredibly hard for me to see the a decimal, you know, a, a leading decimal like that. And I was going to say that's not what I had in my notes. Yeah, I can't read the leading decimals on the other, your chat is on another screen. So 0 0.54. But this is a good lesson for us because it could happen to you that you, in the heat of the moment, copy over some number and then think, okay, well, I got the number, it's 54% and write it in. But you have to always say to yourself, does this number I just calculated, does it make sense? I often see that when uh, students have mistakes on the exams, a lot of times they are mistakes uh, in terms of computational numbers like that, where if you've taken that next step and said, wait, does this number make sense given the data outline? 
then uh, the error would have been caught in the moment. So it's really, this is, I can't stress enough how important it is to always step back from your analysis and then say, okay, does what I found, does this make sense in terms of the context of these data? And uh, also to think about how can I summarize that, which is, you know, your, our exercises nicely help with that by giving us all these fill in the blank framings for the problems. So next up, let's look at B. If possible, find a 95% confidence interval for the percentage of all 25,000 households with three or more large screen TVs. Is this possible to do? Uh, in this case, we'd say it's pretty hard to do because the box is quite lopsided and technically the, and the normal approximation really wouldn't work very well here. Why not? Because look at how lopsided this box is. This is uh, proportionately, you know, the proportions here are 0 0.0141s and uh, 98.6 zeros or so it's quite lopsided and it would take uh in a box like this it would take a lot more draws before we would get to a normal approximation so it's not going to work very well we would say no we really can't use get a confidence interval here because these data are not normal enough Uh, four is just repeating the same steps of analysis here. So we'll go ahead and skip over it, but it is a good problem uh, because as you'll see, you know, we've in the last couple days, our most of our problems have relied on a very similar set of analyses. So I'm, I'm sure many of you are seeing that trend already. And I'd expect that you'd see a similar you know, you, you'll see similar analyses and problems on your exam and on your final, which is, you know, we're getting quite close to two. There's always a lot of overlap between exam three and the final. So let's look at item five. The National Assessment of Educational Progress administer, administers standardized achievement tests to nationwide samples of 17 year olds in school. One year, the tests covered history and literature. You may assume that a simple random sample of size 6,000 was taken. Only 36.1% of the students in the sample knew that Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales but 95.2% knew that Edison invented the light bulb. If possible, find a 95% confidence interval for the percentage of all 17 year olds in school who knew that Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales. If it's possible, if it's not possible, why now? So what do we think here is this do you, do you think it's going to be possible to do to use the normal approximation here? Nobody wants to guess yes anymore. Um, it's yes, we can do it here. We have uh, this is a huge population. So remember, even when the box is really lopsided, when you have a really large, uh, if the sample is small in proportion to the population, then our uh, procedures work more, work better.
Okay, so let's do it. Find the 95% confidence interval. Well, there's lots of steps to get to um, finding the 95% confidence interval. It's never true that the population is too large. Um, the issue is more that if you have um, the proportion, uh, proportional size of the sample to the population. In this case, sure, a se our simple random sample of 6,000 is pretty large, but there's millions of students in, uh, in a nationwide sample of 17-year-olds in school. That's a huge box. So our box has, for our first part here, What's the population? What's in the box? Well, this is our population, which we just said is millions of students. We don't know exactly how many, but there's many of them, millions. And our Z, our uh, ones are, are students who didn't know, or excuse me, who did know that Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, and We can already estimate the percentage of students in the population that knew Chaucer based on our sample. Since our sample data is given to us in percentage format already, we already have our expected value for the box, the number of ones in the box, right? It would be 36, not 38. And this other percentage will be uh, 65.9, oh, 63.9, excuse me, of course. Okay, so that part's easy. Uh, and it's such a basic application. I'm not going to map it out in our terms, but we're going to need to map out our terms to get to our confidence interval, right? We're going to need also to know the standard deviation of the box or to estimate it. In order to get to our standard error, first for the sum, and then we'll get the standard error for the percentage. Just because these are uh, on the pathway. <clears throat> so <clears throat> our next uh, step should be to find the standard deviation of this box or to estimate it. Remember, we use big minus small times the square root of the big fraction times the small one. And 
Notice how we, when we set up the box in a counting setup like this, a one zero, we always assign the outcome of interest a one, which is why these formulas work. Our big, our fraction of ones is 0 0.361 times the smaller fraction of 0 0.639. I bet somebody out there already found our standard deviation of the box. Oh, I already have it too. I can actually read this one. It's about four point, excuse me, about 0 0.48. Thus, we can now move on to getting our standard error which is of course going to be the n of the square root of the n of the draws or the, the n of our, the sample. 6,000 times the standard deviation. Uh, so it's about 37. And we've almost got our standard error for the percentage. We need to do one more step to get there. It is 37, but I just need to write a little smaller, move something. So to get our percentage, we just take our 37 out of our sample size of 6,000 and multiply by 100. So our standard error is 0 0.62 percent. And we're almost to our confidence interval for the percentage of 17 year olds. What we need to know now is now that we have our standard error, we know that the 95% confidence interval is going to be two standard errors above our estimate and two standard errors below. Two times our standard error. Uh, and then that's plus or minus our expected value percent, right? Our expected value is 36.1%. Thus our confidence interval is uh, 2.062 is 1.2%. Either way, so it's our confidence interval is 36.1%, give or take 1.2. <laughs> One point two percent.
And we could easily get the exact range of the confidence interval by just adding this 1.2% and subtracting it. Thank you. Okay, so now we found this confidence interval. And we can look at part B, where it says to find a 95% confidence interval. Now, instead, for the percentage of all 17-year-olds who knew that Edison invented the light bulb. Do you think it's going to be possible to find the, that confidence interval? Well, it's not going to work, huh? I hope. Yes, it is possible. Just like the other one, it's possible because we have um, a pretty large sample here, and uh, this is a pretty, uh, even though this box is lopsided, it's nowhere near as lopsided as our previously, our previous lopsided box, where look at these percentages are. Um, much smaller, although it's close, I agree, but the case is that there's a difference here where this is a, the population is huge, so it's a huge, huge box relative to just a population of 25,000. So yeah, we can bootstrap it. I think the easiest way to do this is we'll just do a second page here. Oh. Uh, I think that it's the same process. I think you you still you should do it. You have to do the second part of the problem. Yes, you can do it. I think we should skip it because we have too much more material. So unless there's a big objection, I mean, we've, we've already done this several times. So let's take a look at some more problems. One year, oh, one year there were 252 trading days on the New York Stock Exchange and IBM common stock, stock went up on 131 of them, about 52%. A statistician attaches a standard error as follows. Is it the right standard error? How would you know if this is the right standard error? Well, one key thing to ask yourself is, is this a random sample? Because if this is not a random sample, we can't get a, a valid standard error this way. That's the first question you should always be thinking, is this a random sample? Is it a random sample? It doesn't sound like it. No, it's not a random sample. Why not? Because these are just days that, uh, 252 trading days. Uh, we don't have a random sample of 252 days. And the furthermore, 
the daily changes are dependent. Each day's closing price is the next day's opening price. So, uh, no, it's not. And we would need a more complicated procedure to do this standard error. Let's look at another hypothetical. And remember, if it doesn't explicitly state it's a simple, it's a random sample or a simple random sample, then you shouldn't assume that it is. Let's see if it's stated in item nine. A bank wants to estimate the amount of change people carry. They take a simple random sample of 100 people and find out that on average, the people in the sample carry 73 cents in change. They figure the standard error is four cents because of the following math. Is this the right standard error? No, this is not the right standard error because it mixes up 73 cents with 73%. They didn't find that in order for this to be right calculations, it would need to be 73% of the population, I don't know, carried change or didn't carry change or something. This is not, it does not work because they mixed up the 73 cents with the proportion. Okay. One hundred draws will be made at random without replacement from a large box of numbered tickets. There are two options to win one dollar if the sum of the draws is bigger than seven hundred and ten to win a dollar or if the sum of draws is bigger than seven point one or if the average of draws is one of these better or are they the same? The key thing to look at here is what they have, the statistic they provided. So this is if the sum of the draws, the sum of 100 draws, and this is the average of the draws. So these are actually the same. The sum of 100 draws, if the average of uh, 100 draws is 7.1, then the sum of those 100 draws is 7.1, why do I keep doing that? 7.1 times 100, which is gonna be 710. Now 100 draws are made at random with replacement from this box 1225. One of the graphs, is a histogram for the numbers drawn, another is a probability histogram for the sum, and the third is just an irrelevant graph. Which is which? Which um, is the histogram for the numbers drawn? Let's do that one first. Yep, it's two. This is going to be the histogram of the numbers drawn. How do we know? Because it looks like the numbers in the box. And the histogram of the numbers drawn is just the numbers drawn, so it will resemble the box. And which one is the probability histogram for the sum? Yes, this is, of course, the probability histogram, and one is irrelevant. Okay. 
And finally, a survey organization takes a simple random sample of 15,000 persons, 1,500 persons, excuse me, from the residents of a large city. Among these sample persons, 1,035 were renters. The expected value for the sample, for the percentage of sample persons who rent is exactly equal to 69% or estimated from the data as 69%. What do we think for A? It's estimated exactly. This is going to be two. These are, this is clearly just an estimate. This is our bootstrapped estimate. Now, what about this B? Uh, the standard error for the percentage of sample persons who rent is exactly equal to or approximately esti estimated from the data. Yep, it's all, this one is also estimated from the data. Here you don't know the composition of the box, so this must be estimated from the data. Very good. So these are some nice samples of problems, and like our previous chapter, they really build on the material earlier in the unit and apply it across context. So you should expect to see problems, some problems that are like some of these multi-step problems here where you, you have to find, that we did today, where you have to find multiple, uh, you have to identify the target statistic or the target observation and then go through a process to get to that value. Remember, for the most efficient way, do some statistics every day.